Good evening. Thank you for having me here. My name is Sue Mulhern, and I work for NAMI Delaware. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to listen to this really important topic. And what we're going to focus on tonight are resources and information about youth mental health. Um, in a few moments, I'll get to why I'm here and why I'm speaking to you about this. Um, before we get started, I do want people to know that there are quite a few emergency or crisis resource centers and lines that are available. So we want you to know that in Northern Delaware, there's a number up here, and we'll make sure that this material goes out on YouTube and we'll make the deck available for people so they have this detail after the, this session. Um, we also have a separate crisis line for Kent and Sussex County. And as always, there is the United States Suicide Prevention Helpline. And for many of our youth and younger people, and actually myself uh, who prefers text, there is a text line and that line will go directly to a support person. And I know this may be a little bit out of, of our purview, but there is now a new national maternal mental health hotline that we want to make sure that people are aware of for individuals who may be suffering from postpartum depression. So I'm just going to introduce you briefly to NAMI Delaware and to myself, again, to tell you why I'm here. And then we're going to talk through youth mental health today, just high-level statistics for a few minutes because I'm not really a statistics person. But then really talk through as family members, as teachers, as peers, what signs and symptoms we might want to look for. And then if we do see some of these signs and symptoms, what do we think we can do with that? How do we build resiliency within our youth population? And what do we do in a crisis situation and non-crisis situations? So we're going to go through a little bit of some heavy topics at one point, but I am absolutely here to tell you the end of the story is there is a lot of hope. Um, and that's what I want you to come away with this, with is that there's a lot of information, resources, and hope. So NAMI Delaware was, I'm sorry, NAMI National was established in 1979 in Missouri by two moms who both had young adult children with mental health diagnoses. They really didn't know what to do, and back in 1979, very little was talked about, many medical conditions. So they ended up starting this organization to connect families and peers to resources in their community. Forward fast to 1983, similarly, Jill and Simon Shute, Jill used to be a teacher at Brandywine High School, some people um, who I know actually know her or had her, they also had an adult son who was diagnosed with severe and persistent mental illness. They had a similar challenge. They didn't know where to go. They didn't know what to do. So they started NAMI Delaware, and they are still active in it. There are 600 NAMIs across the country, so no matter where you go, where you move, where you go on vacation, there is always a NAMI somewhere close by that you can access. So I like to show these pictures of my now adult daughter and me to tell you a little bit about why I'm here. I spent 35 years in corporate America and really didn't understand mental health either in my family or in the corporate environment. I then had to um, navigate the challenges of the preteen, teen, and young adult years with my daughter who was at the time undiagnosed. Lindsay does let me share her story, so I, I want to be really clear. She lets me share her story that she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder at the age of 19. She had been a child that um, was diagnosed with ADHD, anxiety, and depression, but ultimately she had a more acronyms and diagnoses to come out. And we struggled a lot, and I will say I wish I knew, knew then what I know now as an adult on some of the things my daughter was going through that I chalked up to, I'm going to say, typical teenage behavior. I then um, got my own diagnosis with severe and persistent mental illness, and I truly say, thanks to my 19-year-old daughter who said, Mom, we think you need some help too. I ended up personally having a mental health crisis while working for a local corporation, and I tell people it was Barclays because it's such an amazing organization. But I didn't share with people that it was a mental health challenge. Uh, they assumed it was my mom who had recently, an aging mom, had a stroke. When I got back to work, I realized there's not enough talk about mental health. And I remember as a child, I was a child in the 70s and 80s, you know, people would whisper the word cancer, like you didn't want to talk about certain medical conditions, but how do we get better if we don't know, if we don't have the right information? 
So that's when I started volunteering with NAMI, and after pestering them for four years, I'm finally full-time because I have found my passion and have left corporate America. Um, but I show those pictures to show you some, I, I don't show the before pictures anymore when my daughter and I were not doing so great, but to show that there is always hope. So a lot of people may not really think about their mental health. We typically talk about physical health. Are you eating well? Are you exercising? And we really have to look at mental health as I, I call it, um, and physical health, the top and bottom of a quarter. They're both equally as important. And there, that coin is, is just interconnected. Mental health is, we all have it because we're alive, but not everybody has a mental illness. And some mental illnesses are short term, but they can cause serious effects, especially in younger people, if they don't get the appropriate support at a very critical time. So mental illness is very common, very treatable. And again, I wish I knew then what I know now, I truly believe. Had I had better mental health training in general, I might not have had a crisis that put me on disability, but I chose to take disability for a few months if I had had better skills and, and tools. It is an invisible illness, and we never question someone who's got a broken leg or says, I've got a migraine or I've got diabetes, but we tend to tell people things um, that minimize, and I, I should say this on myself, you know, that might minimize a mental health condition and don't really understand them. As I mentioned, it may become a disability, but not everybody with a mental illness is going to have a disability. That's, that's pretty rare, but just to let you know, it can happen. So something that I've learned in the past few years is really an amazing amount, and that's not in a good way, but a very high amount of people do have mental health conditions. About 20% of the people in the United States do have a mental health condition in any given year. And when you look at the lifetime average, 50% of the people with mental health diagnoses had symptoms prior to the age of 14, and 75% of those people had symptoms prior to the age of 24. We all know those are really critical years for our young people, youth, young adults, and children. And in many cases, I, with my, again, now adult daughter, Lindsay, I chalk things up to hormones, to social pressures, to you know, trying to get the right grades. I didn't understand that intermingled with all of that was an undiagnosed mental health condition. For those who do have mental health diagnoses, 50% of them of us haven't sought treatment in the last year. And on average, it takes somebody 11 years to get and seek out the appropriate treatment. That's a really long time, and we all know with COVID and flus and things, you wouldn't wait 11 days to um, really go out and try to get the appropriate support. I personally waited four decades because I just didn't understand, and it ultimately was a physical ailment that took me down that was really related to my mental health condition. Many of us know this um, intellectually, but really stigma is the biggest reason that we don't talk about mental health. That again is another reason why I'm here and why I talk all across the state and across the country to really open up this conversation to protect ourselves, our children, our family members, our peers, our colleagues, and help people understand that there's a lot you can do out there. We do recognize that there is no easy answer to mental health and other things that keep people, and mental health conditions, other things that might keep people from getting the right support could be lack of appropriate insurance, or you can't find the right provider. It could be that you know there's limited options and there's long waits. Your, your child, your young adult, they may not click with the mental health professional that they see the first time, and it might take them a little while, and that takes time out of your life, and it also takes time out of your wallets, frankly. We know there's a severe shortage of mental health practitioners these days that have expertise in, I'm gonna say, youth and young adults 18 and under, it is really hard and we know with COVID, not just in the mental health arena, but in the medical practitioner arena, we've lost a lot of people um, who have chosen to leave that, that world because of the stresses that they have been under. We do also recognize, and, and NAMI not only does education like this, but advocacy, that we need so much more funding and we are working desperately hard to get more funding in this state 
for our schools, for our faith communities, for our corporations, so that mental health awareness programs become second nature. They are everywhere. And we are working really actively with our government to get these programs into schools. And you'll hear, be hearing a lot more about that over the next few months with HB 300 and HB 100, which is to get mental health um, funding for um, junior high schools, high schools, as well as grade schools. We've got to start with early intervention if we want to help our youth. So COVID has definitely brought to light that we seriously need more support for young um, people and their mental health. We have seen so many different things over the past two years, and even though we're coming out of COVID, I still hear people like today saying, oh, COVID's on the uptick again. Our kids have either been out of school, working on Zoom, that doesn't work well for some kids, in and out of school, anxiety perhaps of returning to the school environment, especially with the stressors of the last two years. And it could be, you know, household distress, I, you know, just spending so much time in a closed space with family members and not really having privacy or space that you might have had before. We also know many, many kids um, and their parents have missed out on significant events, on proms, on dances, on graduations in the last few years. So all of that is being internalized. And even our younger students, you know, have missed really important things. And we have to make sure we're talking openly to them so that they can share their feelings. So a recent survey that was done, and this was done in November of 2021. So this is one of the most current uh, surveys is that 77% of the parents surveyed are very concerned about their children's mental health. And 89% of parents do say that their child's mental health is much more important than scholastics and grades. Just because the parents feel that way though, doesn't mean the student feels that way. In many cases, the students are putting a lot of pressure on themselves. And that's again, we wanna keep an eye out there on the stressors that our young people are experiencing. So um, recent reports show that only one in three high school students um, have said that they are able to deal with their stress in the last two years. So a third you know, of them are saying they can deal with it. That's two thirds that can't. Uh, we've seen significant increases at all ages. I don't wanna just sound like it's youth and, and our young people, but at all ages of substance misuse, you know, alcohol misuse. We've got um, overdoses, suicidal ideation, and they're topics that can be really difficult to talk about but these are happening in our homes. We also know that certain communities, such as our Latinx community and our LGBT community, has significantly more stressors and they also have significantly more likelihood of having symptoms of anxiety or depression or having challenges with their mental health. So I'm gonna jump off statistics. I really put those out there to let us all know you are not alone with what you may be dealing with with your family and there's probably a lot more resources out there in the community than you realize. So some of the common warning signs, these may not all be in play at the same time and you may only see one or two of them, but if you're seeing signs and symptoms for two to four weeks or longer, that's usually the rule of thumb that medical practitioners use to say something might be wrong and we wanna look at it. Um, and I should preface this, I am not a medical practitioner, um, but I, um, I speak to this because of my lived experience with myself and my daughter. So, you know, difficulty concentrating, you know, eating too much, not eating enough, sleeping too much, you know, sleeping too little. Um, it, perhaps it's the experience of a racing heart or panicking or anxiety attacks that didn't exist before. And in many cases, there's severe mood swings. Now, I look back on Lindsay's junior high and high school years and I can say she experienced a lot of these that I know weren't mental health related. I knew something might have been going on with school or with an exam or with a friend group, but then there were times we really couldn't put our fingers on it and that's what I should have seen as a sign or a symptom that I needed to get her some extra support. Other warning signs can be severe risk taking, you know, driving too fast, drinking too much, um, binge drinking is typically what it's called. Significant weight loss or weight gain, especially if, um, if it could be related to using laxatives, medication. Um, excessive use of drugs or alcohol at this age range, uh, you know, no drugs or alcohol should be used, but we do know that sometimes um, young people do experiment and that can lead down a dangerous path. 
And then making plans or, um, har uh, or plans to harm themselves or to kill themselves. And again, super sensitive topic. And sometimes we just don't know what to look for to know those symptoms are out there because people are very good about hiding that. So a few other warning signs I want to talk to that sometimes are missed that I truly didn't know could be signs of a mental health diagnosis include you know, constant fatigue, physical pain. Almost 50% of the people who have depression also complain of physical pain. Um, there's perfectionism. Uh, there are some people who that is like a compensating control for them. If they, their minds and bodies may feel out of control, perfectionism may be a way that they try. They, our students, our family, our friends, try to counterbalance that. Um, lack of emotion, loss of ability to feel joy, that happened to be one of my personal symptoms. Not only could I not feel joy, but I was trying to numb myself out to the depression and anxiety that I was experiencing. And avoidance. Um, you know, Delaying coping, um, coping mechanism could be just procrastinating or not doing things, especially when you see a significant change in your child, in your student, in your loved one, you might want to call that out. So I want to talk about um, some early interventions, and I'm also going to talk very briefly about suicide and some of the symptoms we might, might want to look for. So I do want to just put that out there if anybody who is on our webcast wants to, does not want to hear um, the next few minutes, just you know, go on mute. <clears throat> so um, before we get to that, though, mental health conditions rarely go away on their own. You're not going to wish it away, sleep it away, dream it away, uh, vacation it away. And over time, the condition becomes much more complex and harder to manage. So imagine if you've got a child with diabetes or a broken leg and you don't deal with it right away, it's going to get worse. The symptoms could get worse. There could be some severe medical situations that come. Same thing with mental health. Mental health and mental health diagnoses are medical conditions. Addressing these concerns earlier also gives you more options. It gives you time to find and sh I'm going to say shop around for the right practitioner, the right person who clicks with your child, your young adult. And also, um, addressing mental health concerns is diff looks differently for different people. So you're going to want to really reach out into the community, talk to a general practitioner, call NAMI Delaware. We don't necessarily refer individual doctors, but we've got a lot of great um, opportunities to share different facilities and medical practitioner um, practices that may be able to support you as you're looking for the right person. So what more can I do for a loved one? And I think I've broken every one of these rules even since my own mental health crisis. But do your best to notice symptoms, whether it's in yourself, your child, a spouse, a loved one, even a colleague. Do it non-judgmentally. Do your best, to, and I, I'll repeat some of these things through the next slides, but use I statements if you see someone that's acting differently. You know, I've noticed you're not joining us for lunch, or honey, you're not coming to dinner, you know, sitting down to dinner with us. What's going on? Um, identify how much the symptoms are impacting you or your loved one. An easy way I like to use to remember this is, is this condition or is, are these behaviors impacting the ability to live, love, laugh, or learn? And if this, these symptoms are impacting any or all of those for two to four weeks or beyond, it could be something that is severe and persistent and not a short-term situation. And frankly, there's a fifth L that none of us really want to think about, but it's law enforcement. And some people with mental health diagnoses that aren't treated may become involved with law enforcement in a negative way. So if you're not sure, just think about, is this impacting my child's ability to live, love, laugh, or learn? Um, don't make promises of confidentiality. There will be times, and whether it's you or another trusted adult, don't make promises of confidentiality if the individual has expressed any um, violence to self or violence to others. That's where you might say, I can't keep this to myself, but I will, simp I will just talk to Mr. Townsend or a you know, trusted medical professional or a counselor. But don't make promises that you won't tell anybody if there is a risk of danger and if you think there's a crisis situation brewing or that has come. And if you have concerns, act on them. I, will, I look back on my daughter's high school and early college years, and um, I truly think there, but the grace of God go I, that there were so many close calls, so many times 
I didn't approach her situation as directly as I should have, and I'm very fortunate that she's still here with us. So I'm not going to read through all of this, but I know the materials will be handed out. Empathy and communication. I'm a project manager by trade. I'm a problem solver. So I really had to work on how do I approach my daughter, even now. And there's times I say, honey, are you looking for me to help solve a problem? Or are you looking for me to just listen? But it took me a lot of years to get to that empathetic approach. So do your best to be empathetic, be non-judgmental. Be open, and in, in many cases, don't try to be the fixer. Don't try to solve the problem, just listen. Sometimes your child just needs to get that information out, or your student. Um, be honest about treatment. Normalize mental health and say, you know, feelings are just feelings. You can't change them overnight, but if you are having some serious, sad, depressive, anxiety feelings, let's find the right person to help address those with you. Um, and empowerment over shame. I felt a lot of shame with my diagnosis, and I know my daughter did initially with hers. And we now both speak about how do we take the stigma away, and, it, and if people do use stigmatizing words, how do we gently guide them to something that's a bit more um, appropriate. So I want to talk about high-risk situations, and this is where I mentioned it is sensitive um, if you need to step away for a few minutes. But the most important thing in any high-risk situation, whether it's your student, family member, spouse, grandmother, anybody, these rules of thumb are important to know. So the risk factors, um, as well as protective factors related to suicide include, but they're not, this is not all encompassing, but really include if you see social isolation, if you see changes in behavior and personality, um, in many cases, people might try to self-medicate with excessive use of drugs or alcohol. Um, and lack of behavioral health care, somebody may stop seeing a mental health expert or even a medical practitioner like a GP if they're not feeling right. If, people, if the individual threatens to hurt or um, uh, kill themselves, if they're accessing means, you only know that if you ask the right questions, and we'll get to those on, on the next slide. Extreme mood swings may also be examples of warning signs. And examples of protective factors, and that's really why we're here to put hope around these difficult topics, is you know, creating an environment with appropriate behavioral health care. Not everybody has easy access to that. Call NAMIDelaware.org or our, our hotline, and we can help connect those who may not have appropriate medical care to medical practitioners who will see them. Um, a feeling of connectedness is really important. All it takes is one person, and especially for youth and young adults, one trusted adult in their lives to turn things around. And that comes from a survey from 2019 um, from Dartmouth. Uh, a sense of purpose, as well as giving our kids problem-solving skills and helping them understand this may feel like forever, but it's temporary, and I'm here to help get you through what's going on. So when it comes to the concerns that you might have, as hard as it is, and it's always hard for me to talk through these slides, it's my personal life experience, but you need to ask the question, are you thinking about killing yourself? And we don't say, are you thinking about harming yourself? Because some people will interpret that as um, cutting um, self-mutilation that is not intended to kill themselves. So we really try to be specific because an individual who's contemplating suicide may say no to that because they plan on taking their life. Um, tell maybe at a higher risk to attempt suicide. And I also don't want to insinuate that those who don't have not made these plans do not, does not necessarily mean it's a lower risk. Anytime you feel whether it has been said to you by the individual or you feel in your gut that this is a really serious situation, take action. You can call the suicide um, a lifeline. You can talk to your school counselors. Remember, if the individual, your child, a student has said something, don't leave them alone if it's an active crisis. Try to get someone to come be with you. And if you need to, you know, put your phone, call 911, um, call for medical support, and leave it on the speaker so the individual is part of that conversation. And as I talked about in the beginning, um, there is 
uh, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline as well as the text line 741741. Highly encourage people to keep that in their phones. For those that are interested in more detail, NAMI does offer a one-hour um, suicide prevention seminar. It's called QPR. It's offered three or four times a month, and you can go to our website if you're interested in joining in that. But QPR stands for question, persuade, and um, refer. So our goals are that we are not medical professionals, but we have to ask the questions, persuade the individual to stick with us while we're referring them to the appropriate help. I'm going to pause there because I know that's a really sensitive subject and, and I know um, we have a handful of folks in the room. Are there any questions that I can address right now? Yes. If I'm understanding the question correctly, and let me repeat it and tell me if I'm getting it right or wrong, um, if you were in a remote setting and some uh, a student or somebody has um, intimated uh, suicidal ideation, is it what do you do in that case? Do you take it seriously? You always take it seriously. Absolutely. And that's one of the um, things we really learned and we really try to stress is Never assume it's attention getting, even if it ends up being that, you can't assume, especially for a young person under the age of 25, their brains are not fully developed, the judgment center is not fully developed. It, it may be an attention seeking um, item, but we can't assume that, and it doesn't mean that a permanent decision might not be made by that student for a temporary problem. Did that address your question? And it's so much harder in the Zoom world. Um, I know when I teach classes over Zoom, I'm required to have um, everybody's cell phone numbers um, in case somebody, especially when we talk about difficult topics, you know, drops from the line or has an, a, a situation or an issue. So we usually teach as a team of two so that someone can follow up with an individual on Zoom via phone call to make sure they're okay. Any other questions right now? So encouraging resilience in a non-crisis situation. Um, there are so many things that we can do to help someone who may not be in a crisis. And I will tell you, if it's a crisis and you are not sure what to do, call 911, call the Suicide Prevention Hotline. I should have mentioned both of those if I didn't already. But in a non-crisis situation, how do we build resilience? Well, we want to be good listeners. We've got two ears and one mouth, like the old analogy. You know, so she would we should listen twice as much as we speak. My family would say, I don't know how to do that. I'm one of seven kids, and I talk a lot. Um, but make sure you do your best to avoid body language, tone of voice, and words that come across as judgmental. Um, also, empathize with their frustration. You don't have to agree with it to empathize with it. And remember, uh, I, if you can remember back when you were that age, you know, whether it's grades or dating or social life or sports, that's the whole world for our students. And we can't just say, oh, it'll get better as you get older. Or it's, you know, you've got a really good, you, you know, you're going to a great school, you've got a you know, car to drive. We have to take these situations seriously and help them build up their own resilience. Um, help them to understand that negative emotions are part of everyday life and we can learn how to help them deal with it by showing that we as the adults in their lives are practicing self-care. We're taking care of ourselves, whether it's exercise, eating well, mindfulness, meditation, art, dancing. We need to show that we take our mental health and physical health very seriously and as a priority so that they learn from us. They're going to learn by what we do, not just what we say. And model how to overcome challenges and failures. Be honest with your, with your kids and your students um, if you've made a mistake or if you've had a challenge and what you're trying to do to get through it. Also, uh, this was one of the hardest ones for me. When my daughter was going through some of her crisis, I, w I thought I should be the one to help and that I, you know, I'm her mom. And I had to come to the realization that I was not the right person 
and that Lindsay needed trusted adults in her life that were outside of our home. I was very lucky that she's close to my sister and she was very close to one of her um, best friend's mothers. And there were times where I had to reach out to them and say, can you check in on Lindsay? Or I would you know, say, Lindsay, can you talk to Aunt Pam or can you talk to Kristen? And I won't ask them details. They'll only talk to me if they're concerned for um, you know, violence to self or violence to others. So don't be afraid to ask for help, especially if you're at a point where your student, your child doesn't want to speak with you directly. Just help them get to somebody. So a lot of these are a bit repetitive, but you know, being as calm, consistent, as comforting as you can, taking seriously what the situation is that they're going through, making sure that you ask open-ended questions, not just a yes-no question, avoid fixing the problem or dismissing the problem, um, don't ignore the signs and symptoms. I'll say this three or four different times, but I, I chalked a lot up to Lindsay as typical teen behavior, and it was much more serious than that. And looking back, we were very fortunate that she was able to get to the right adults in her life to support her when it wasn't me. Um, for older kids, normalize conversations on mental health. Talk to them about it. And for younger kids, um, whether it's you know kindergarten, grade school, even younger, start teaching them, because early on it's better, how to put names to their emotions. What are your big feelings today, honey? You know, it's okay to feel those feelings. It's the sooner we get children starting to talk about mental health, and, and I've turned to mindfulness and meditation, which I never thought I would. Ten years ago, I've been like, that's woo-woo or whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to say. But I, would, but I now believe that every, every person should have that in their lives, even if it's only five or ten minutes a day with a guided app, so you don't even have to really think about it. And then again, we've talked about practicing your own self-care. And I have to say, this is one of my favorite images. Is, you know, the world is a scary place, but I have armbands. We called them floaties when Lindsay was little. But we want our kids to know, you've got a lot of armbands or floaties out there, and you, we want to make them feel comfortable enough to reach out to those people so that they have support going through some dark hallways, is, is what I call the, the depressive or the anxiety times. And then other strategies for building resilience, you know, connection, um, teaching your children empathy, teaching them to listen to others, asking them if a friend were to talk to you about a similar situation, what do you think you would say to them? Or um, let's talk through what the potential worst case scenario is for this situation. So what's the worst thing that might happen? Is that really so bad? How do we avoid that? Um, encouraging self-reflection and discovery. This is the hardest one for me because I said I'm a project manager and I'm a fixer, but I had to finally get to the point where I'm like, honey, you need to talk to that teacher or you need to call and make that appointment for yourself. At that point, she was like 16 or 17 or, you know, if you're having problems at work, you need to talk to your manager. I can't talk to them for you. So in age appropriate ways, help your kids, your students um, find ways to build up those problem solving skills. And then keep it in perspective. I mentioned this earlier, but it, it may feel like forever. And I sadly, or I don't know, maybe it's good. I can close my eyes and still go back to 17 or 18 and think of some situations that I just thought, oh, my world is going to come to an end. It didn't, but at that time, it seemed super important. And if we can help put it into perspective, that might be supportive for your kids. So in non-crisis situations, we always consider general mental health and physical health. You know, sleep better. Uh, make sure you put a, you know, right side, that the appropriate time for sleep. I'm still that person who has my phone playing Wordle or Words with Friends in my bed, and they say, you shouldn't have that phone, you know, before you go to sleep. So, good sleep habits. Um, avoiding drugs and alcohol. Um, if I am an adult with ADD, so I have to use lists. I, I didn't realize that I had that until I was 43, but I've always been a list maker. So, teach your children how to organize. Um, mindfulness practice we just touched on, um, and creating an, you know, a support outside of school or your workplace. I consider school the kids' workplace, and you know, share NAMI resources. We also are connected with many other nonprofits in the community related to mental health, and we are happy to, to connect the dots. And um, a great quote, um, do the best you can until you know better, and then uh, when you know better, do better. I still, personally feel bits of guilt for things I wish I had known back then and my 
my boss continues to say, you know, you didn't know it then. So she, she is the one who guided me to this quote. And then just very quickly before I wrap up and open it up to more questions, um, NAMI is here. NAMI is a national organization and NAMI Delaware covers all of Delaware to support, educate, and advocate. Um, we are always open to coming to faith communities, schools, business organizations, um, educator groups, whatever you need, we're available. We are not medical professionals and we have a small staff, but our staff is really diverse. We cover um, the African American community. We have three Latinx people on staff. Um, we have um, LGBTQ covered. We've got everything from, I'm gonna say the age of 20. I think I'm the oldest one at 57. So we cover lots of different age groups and um, we do our best to have people come and speak who can really talk to the situations that you may wanna listen to. Um, we do offer safe, affordable housing in case there's ever a mental health situation um, that is diagnosed. We do offer housing in our state. We've talked about advocacy. Um, I do want to point out that we offer classes. Um, they're typically two hours for, um, for four to six weeks for people that are caregivers, family members um, who are looking to learn more about mental health, how to manage your family, and we also offer classes for peers. We offer peer support groups and family support groups. Yes. The, everything is still via Zoom right now unless it's specifically requested by the organization, and that's organization by organization. So if you have an organization that wants to do it in person and has a place to host it, we'll do that. I'm sorry. If it's general community, right now we are still offering these via Zoom because we cover the whole state. And that way we have, every, you know, everybody can join no matter where they are without having to drive. We haven't made that decision yet. If we have enough people that are interested in a certain county, we will offer. And in person, um, we just keep an eye on what people are asking for, frankly. And Zoom, every time we do a survey, we get over 85% um, people preferring Zoom. And then the smaller percentage, obviously, that would like to do in person. But if there's something specific you're looking for, let me know, because we're always looking to start a list of people preferred in person. So um, I'm happy to have you reach out to me, and I'll make sure you get the information. I miss being in person. Um, we also have, um, in our own voice, we have youth-related programs, Say It Out Loud, uh, Ending the Silence, so we do a program specifically for youth. I've mentioned our suicide prevention program. We also offer mental health first aid for adults and me youth mental health first aid for adults that deal with um, youth and young people on a regular basis. We have support groups. We have a non-crisis line. I should highlight we are a non-crisis center. We've talked about our diversity, and um, we, again, will make sure that you get a copy of this, or you'll be able to see it on YouTube for local resources here in the state of Delaware, as well as um, lots of different handouts. These links are hot links, um, if I can get this to you. So that's the end of the presentation, and I want to thank everybody for your time and attention. In my mind, a lot of this is what I consider general knowledge that we just need a reminder on. I, I use the, the joke that I've been on Weight Watchers probably 15 times in my 50 plus years. I know I'm supposed to eat well and move more. Do I do it all the time? No, so I need those general reminders. And this information is not to put any blame on anybody. It's just saying, hey, what do you know? How can you better help care for the people in your life? Again, whether it's a child, a spouse, a colleague, all of this information should be able to help everybody work on their mental health. And I also just wanna wrap up before we take questions that I don't wanna insinuate that self-care and meditation and mindfulness is gonna solve or cure a mental health situation. It is something that can be coupled with appropriate medical care and only you your child and your practitioner can decide what that appropriate medical care is. Whether it's psychiatry, psychology, talk therapy, possibly medications, we don't recommend any or all of those. It's you finding the right resources and we can help you connect with those. So that's the presentation for this evening. Are there any questions? Yes.
That's a great question. The question we had when it comes to physical health and mental health, and I, one of the stats up there was 50% of the people with depression actually uh, also feel physical pain. What is that correlation? I'm not a doctor, but I can tell you um, the symptoms that I had physically were coming from my mental health. So I, I, my mental health, um, undiagnosed at the time, disorder. And I will, I'm fine sharing that I am a chronic low, person with chronic low blood pressure. And for a few weeks, I wasn't feeling right. My head was feeling swooshy. My um, blood pressure had gone up to 198 over 110. I am usually like 100 over 60. And what was happening was my chemical imbalance in my brain was so far off, and I was ignoring it, that my body actually began to break down from the stress. So in looking back on the situation and knowing what was going on in my personal and professional life, I know the physical symptoms came from my mental health. Doesn't mean it can't be the other way. If you have an individual, perhaps this is seen a lot with our older generation, if someone is diagnosed with a chronic medical condition, depression can, can set in um, because they don't want to be a burden to their family or they don't want to you know, have a lot of money spent going into an assisted living facility. So I wish I could give you an, a real cut and dried answer, but it's not always cut and dried. Great question. Any other questions? Yes. Great question. So um, we're talking about now NAMI's correlation and in our, in our relationship with schools and other organizations, for those of you that have joined um, via um, WebEx, I think it is. Uh, we are a community resource and we'll support anybody that comes out to connect with us. So we're here because um, Brandon, Mr. Townsend, um, reached out to us and asked for us to support. So we are a very small organization we will proactively reach out to faith community schools, et cetera, to say what we have available, but it's up to the individual organization to then proactively accept our services. We are not medical professionals. We are not medical um, providers or practitioners. So the services we offer are based on NAMI National, as well as our organization doing studies and research on different mental health to topics. Does that answer it? Any other questions or comments? I really appreciate, oh, I'm sorry, question? Oh, thank you. I really appreciate your time and attention. I know that it's you know always kind of tough coming out on a nighttime after a holiday. And mental health is not always the easiest topic to talk about, but it is important. And if anything comes up, if, if you think of anything, there's any services that you want us to try to help connect the dots, because we, we aren't a service provider, um, you can reach out to namide.org. You can find my email there. You can also see my email is s for Sue, s mulhern at namide.org. I think I might have some business cards, but we're always willing to create uh, and do custom research when it comes to mental health if it's something we have not addressed and it would be important for your school community and or your families. I thank you all so much for your attention and I always encourage people, you know, do a little self-care for you because sometimes even just talking briefly on some of these topics can, you know, cause some kind of, um, you know, reactions for us and they're not always positive. So please do a little bit of self-care tonight and feel free to reach out to me at any point. I will get back to you within less than 24 hours. <laughs>